Hello, my name is Joel Z. Williams and welcome to another episode of Props Scale Model Building. Um, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to coach you up in how to apply a good camouflage scheme to a Tamiya Mitsubishi A6M3 Zero, also known as a HAMP. Um, this is the box in which it came. This is the, uh, i give you a good look at it. This is the 148th uh, scale of the model. And one of the things I think is interesting here is they're, they're depicting in their artist illustration of the um, Zero, they're depicting the July 1943 directive that came down from the Imperial Naval um, uh, Command, High Command. Basically every fighter aircraft that was stationed in the South Pacific was ordered to apply this jungle green pattern over what the Japanese af affectionately called the, the bamboo green color. So here is an example of the bamboo green. <clears throat> Let me show you what that looks like. Right here. So that is what all the Japanese zeros looked like basically that color um, up until about July 1943. Now let me explain historically what was going on in July of 1943. This is the Japanese had experienced a, a great benefit because of the Japanese Zero. Let me give you some pictures of the Japanese Zero, what it looks like. These are the historical photos of what the A6M3 would look like. Different color schemes going there. Okay, so that, that gives you an idea. Now what was going on is for the first time America was really getting into the war in the Pacific um, and we we're coming up against this Japanese fighter that was about 5,000 pounds lighter than the average American fighter. The um, Well, I guess the Hellcat came later, but the Hell Diver, uh, these type of carrier-borne aircraft, the Japanese had figured out a way to make it extremely light, the, the Zero, extremely light carrier born so it could be launched from carriers but it had because of the, the lightness it could take advantage of not having to carry as much fuel and the fuel it did carry helped it with an extended range so you can imagine a squadron of maybe 40 of these launching from the aircraft carrier Kaga or, or um, you know any one of the Japanese carriers in Bougainville in that area in, in uh, Papua New Guinea. So they could travel for about 200, 300 nautical miles away from the carrier, giving the aircraft carrier a much wider awareness of what was going on. So the Japanese effectively were able to control large swaths of, of land, uh, of water, and then later land. And one of the things that they did is they took this very long lasting I mean, these things could stay up for three or four hours at a time, uh, depending on the wind condition. It took advantage, the Japanese Naval High Command took advantage of that range and said, you know, let's just put them on land. We can, we don't need a carrier, we can just leave a permanent uh, couple squadrons of these in, in uh, New Britain, and we could dominate the shipping lanes going in to Australia. So Australia in July of 1943 was in danger of being choked out and an, an order, a directive, a paint scheme directive came down from the Japanese High Command and when they made this switch to moving their carrier borne fighters to land they made a directive that the out, outer coating, or I'm sorry, outer paint scheme include what is known affectionately as jungle green. So this is what we're left with is a color scheme designed to keep it hidden while it's parked on the ground. And you can imagine a, an, aircraft an aircraft this light could land on something uh, like gravel, very didn't take a lot to make a runway. A dirt strip in the middle of a jungle would be sufficient 
to land 30 or 40 of these, fuel them up, get them back in the air, put some bombs on them, put some new rounds in the, in the guns. But the problem with finding something like this is you first got to see through the foliage. You have to find it on the ground and try to kill it because it's so quick, so maneuverable that most of the American strikes against the Japanese fighters were actually planned to hit them right at dusk while they were parked on the ground. And so to combat that, that the Imperial Naval High Command came out with that order in 1943 and required every Japanese plane to get these green splotches. And so what I'm going to teach you how to do today is to recreate that camouflage scheme and put it on your model and you're going to be left with uh, a very good rendition and I think accurately historically supportable argument that this particular design camouflage de design pattern um, is probably one that you would have more frequently you would have seen more frequently in the islands of the South Pacific particularly the Caroline Islands uh, truck in um, in particular uh, Rabal uh, in, in New Britain so this is how we're going to do it Make sure I set up here straight. I don't have my help today, my photo director, so I have to do, I have to wear many hats in this operation. But one of, one of the things I wanted to show you, I've, I've already practiced here earlier and, and put down some of the Tamiya um, uh, XF-11. This is their, their green, their jungle green. But one of the things I wanted to try to show you is when you do this, you have to admit to yourself that this is going to be very, very difficult to airbrush. Even if you were to reduce your airbrush to 10 PSI, 15 PSI, and do, go over it very accurately, it's going to be very hard to recreate the actual patterns. And trust me, I've tried everything from... Uh, salt applying salt to the to the uh, out, outer coating, but uh, you know I mean even I even use microsol, you know coated the salt uh, and micro mass I'm sorry but I coated the salt in the micro mass and then applied it. I even tried starch and there, I tried a plethora of uh, of different uh, strategies to obtain this met this look. But one of the things I'm going to teach you is I'm going to teach you to trust yourself. Trust yourself. And I spent a lot of time, a lot of money, trying to figure out how to beat this problem. Because this really is a difficult task to come up with a camouflage scheme that is completely random looking, but also offers the disruptive pattern that the Japanese High Command was seeking back in 1943. So you gotta try to stay historically accurate to what was actually going down and at the same time recreate something that's gonna look like it it, it might work. You know, you have to be plausible in, in your application of historical type camouflage patterns. And so I, this, the, this lecture really is to show you some shortcuts and some techniques that will save you a lot of time. Um, okay, so what I do is I always use acrylic paints whenever I can. Tamiya luckily makes a very good um, jungle green, as I said earlier. I'm going to shake that up pretty good, get that agitated. And that's probably sufficient because I have been using it earlier today. And then I will use uh, a little bit of water <coughs> to cut, cut the, uh, the paint if I need to and to clean the brush. Whenever you use acrylics, the beauty of acrylic paints are that, is that they are uh, water soluble. So you can use water to uh, clean up your brushes or to um, reduce the paint if that is needed. So what you need to do is start out with a pretty good brush. And I hear I'm using a 10, uh, or actually this is a 3.0. Um, but you kind of kind of wet, wet the brush first, get a, get a little wet with water. And this brush looks like it has residue from previous use, which is a big no-no. You should never put up your brush uh, without cleaning it first. 
but if you if you don't it's not it, when you're using acrylic it's not a game ender you can always put some of this um, uh, what are they calling it nowadays uh, brush cleaner I thought I had a the masters brand I thought it was Doc Johnson but it, anyway they have a, a brush cleaner that you can purchase really cheaply and what it has is a, a cleaning agent but it also has a kind of a preserver for your brushes <clears throat> and as you can see this is a blonde hair brush and and the hairs are nice bright bright orange like they first came uh, when I got them in the package so you want to get all that residue off before you start this process but uh, so there's a little delay one of these delays that you always run into whenever you're skill model building there'll be 15 different things that'll slow you down so let me hurry up and get some paint on here. I know you guys are getting anxious. YouTube videos. Okay, here we go. All you really need to do is kind of wet the tip of that brush with that paint. You don't need to get it sopping wet, but you know, you kind of want to do that. Get, it, get a good uh, lead down there. Now, what I do is I kind of look at the, di the, the uh, artist illustration of it. And I, and I just kind of think, okay, I can't make all of these big, and they can't all be long. So just start out with a couple big ones. Put a couple big ones down. And, and what I tell people is stay with a, a really weird shape that's not normally found in nature. Something that's odd, a little jagged. And you have to kind of trust yourself. This is the artist part of it. You have to use your individual judgment on what would be likely. You got to think about where where they lo where they're located at the time. You know, they're in 1943. They're in a, a jungle environment. There's probably not a lot of tools uh, readily available to them. A lot of paint brushes. They're probably having to improvise a lot of this stuff. And, you know, when a Japanese imperial directive comes down, you don't ignore it. You got to do something. And what I imagine happened is some Japanese calligraphy guy said, you know what? If we just take our time and look at the bushes and the foliage that is around us, we try to recreate something exactly the same shape, dimension, texture, color. We probably will get very close to replicating something that someone might actually find if they were to look at the jungle from the sky. And don't get in a hurry doing this either. Don't think you're going to try to hurry creativity. Creativity comes as it flows. You can't force it. You can't direct it. You can't put it on a timetable. But while I'm doing this, let's talk about that Japanese Zero a little bit more. Um, one of the things a lot of people don't realize is that the Japanese Zero had one huge drawback is that the original designers did not uh, integrate self-sealing fuel tanks. That seems like a minor thing but if anybody that's ridden a bicycle if you have those slime type bicycle inner tubes you could hit a nail you could hit a piece of glass and it would puncture your uh, inner tube but the slime would fill the hole that was created by that nail and you would be able to at least get home your, your air wouldn't lose all, your tire wouldn't lose all of its air and uh, 
So that's a, the, the concept of the self-sealing fuel tank. The Japanese, and this technology was widely known at the time. Um, so it's quite, it's, it's really kind of a, a mystery why the Japanese did not integrate self-sealing fuel tanks into the to the, their aircraft. But the the not the result of that decision was that it, when American planes even scored a minimal hit with a armor-piercing incendiary round from their guns, which all all of the bullets were armor-piercing incendiary, um, it, it would create a fire in the Japanese Zero that would re almost result in total loss, uh, at least a cat catastrophic failure. A lot of times um, pilots would not even be around long enough to bail out. So that's one of the shortcomings of, that's always the old tor tortoise or hare argument. You know, you give up weight for speed and endurance, but in that weight that you're giving up, you're also giving up that self-sealing fuel tank. Also, the Japanese Zero was a little underpowered uh, Armament-wise, two um, 7.72, I think, machine guns, and then two 20 millimeter cannons that were, are not probably not even quite 20 millimeter, probably closer to 16 or 17 millimeter cannons that were um, placed right in the nose. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of Japanese. As a matter of fact, one of the, the most storied Japanese Zero pilot, uh, Seik, Seikyu, Seikyu, I can't pronounce his name, um, but he actually reported shooting a Grumman Wildcat and spent probably four or five hundred rounds on it from the light machine gun and um, sucker kept on flying away. And he, he remembers being astonished by the hardiness of American aircraft certainly a lot heavier um, and every American aircraft had the self-sealing fuel tank but what I'm trying to teach you here is be confident in yourself um, a lot of scale model builders become what I call what ifs and they go what if I order this component that'll make this job easier?